Welcome to the round table, which is Brexit and the future of European political science. My name is Radek Markowski, I'm from the University of Social Sciences and Humanities in Warsaw. And the distinguished uh, colleagues, researchers, professors that are going to yeah, introduce you to the topic is uh, Susan Banducci from the University of Exeter. Uh, Richard Willeker, University of Leicester, uh, Sofia Vasilopoulou, University of York, and Keith Van Der Eyck, University of Nottingham. Um, here is how we are going to proceed. I think uh, uh, this is going to last uh, one hour, 30 minutes, so the, the discussant will have first 10 minutes to uh, spell out what is on their mind and uh, what they think of the topic. Then, uh, if need be, uh, a short uh, summary, if, if not, then we'll go directly to the questions and answer sessions which you are expected to take an active part and then uh, probably a, a short uh, responses to all those uh, uh, important and uh, crucial otherwise issues raised from the floor. Uh, initially, the, the, the event envisages that we should concentrate on uh, uh, four areas. One is substantive research agendas of, in European political science, including the use of referenda to decide public policy, funding and grants, the second topic, free movement of academics and students in research and teaching uh, collaborations. From uh, what I have seen in exchange of emails, uh, it is likely to be about this and also very likely that there will be other topics and issues mentioned. So without uh, further uh, delay, and I think the kind of way of proceeding will be to go alphabetically, Susan Gallucci first. Uh, okay. mm, thank you. Thank you very much. Because um, actually what, what I would like to say <coughs> is, is very much um, not related to any of those topics. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think, from my perspective, it was an opportunity to say, uh, or to have an opportunity to say things that I have been thinking about um, since um, the referendum um, last, last year, um, and things that I wish I had said in, in the run-up to the, the, the referendum vote. Um, so, and I think we all hear a lot from our um, vice chancellors and for, from our deans about how we're supposed to deal with, um, uh, as in our profession, and to operate about funding and uh, amongst our colleagues. Um, we're, you know, we have those conversations uh, quite regularly. Um, but just to start by saying that I am um, quite naively, I think, hoping that the snap election in, in uh, June uh, will mean that we really are not leaving the EU. Uh, so, uh, I'm yeah. Currently, uh, so I, I, I'm still holding out that hope. And I, I know that some people will tell me I'm being foolish and naive, but there it goes. Um, I am, and I'm still profoundly depressed by the outcome of the uh, referendum vote. Um, I think we all are dealing with a lot of uncertainty, especially for our colleagues uh, from the EU about funding, about their jobs, about whether they can stay in the, in the UK. And I would just say that any university uh, that is not now promising uh, to cover the legal fees and to provide support for their um, EU staff members and to cover the costs of visas to stay in the UK, if your universities are not offering that, they, they should be, and we should be demanding that they do. Um, we know also as educators that we have um, um, uh, also profoundly depressed by the opportunities that our students have um, lost out on, um, UK-based students to travel and work in the EU, and also for EU students um, to come to the UK to study. We know um, applications are down seven to between 7 and 14 percent from EU students to study in the UK. Um, and that means that our students here are, will not have um, the diverse and rich environment uh, that they deserve um, and that we also deserve to, to be able to teach in. Um, we also know, um, or I think from a, from a very practical sense and perspective, is that every meeting that I now go to, um, there's a Brexit <laughs> talk. Everything is talked about uh, in terms of 
how Brexit influences everything from student recruitment to marketing uh, to program development, uh, even open days. Uh, I was at a, um, doing my open day talk and I get to the bit in the talk where I talk about Erasmus <coughs> exchanges. And immediately uh, I get a response in the audience, well, that clearly that is over. And I knew from the tone and from that, um, the way it was approached, that this was someone <laughs> who was um, uh, happy not to have that opportunity any, any longer, um, probably a, a lead voter. And at that point I felt, I, I, felt I, I, I got a sense of how uh, perhaps my EU colleagues felt, those who were told that, gee, after uh, the vote, isn't it, aren't you supposed to be going home now, or leaving the UK? Um, but it was very uh, instructive, that immediate uh, reaction from a parent, not a student, a parent in the audience saying, clearly we will not be doing Erastus exchanges anymore. That opportunity is not there. And I had to uh, then pull out the sheet of paper that my, uh, you know, my uh, uh, marketing person is giving me and on what we can and cannot say now in open day talks about the EU. So I had to give out, I didn't get it out, I had reversed it before. You know, no, we're proceeding as if this, uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen and we're just going ahead as if these opportunities uh, are available. So those are sort of, I, I think, concerns that we are all, um, we all have and we all share. So some of the other things I was, uh, I am thinking about as we are in Brexit uh, UK, um, are, are things like, um, or, or what is, what items are not on the agenda, are not being talked about, what narratives are being neglected? And I think one of the um, neglected narratives is, really, is about gender equality uh, and what happens to uh, women's concerns as we go through uh, <coughs> negotiations and what happens to the positive changes that have happened um, due to EU membership such as recognizing the workplace rights of pregnant women. Where are they on the Brexit agenda? <coughs> yes, we've, we've had assurances um, that all will pretty much remain the same, but um, that they are not really being uh, discussed. Uh, we do know that the EU has been, has been good for women in terms of protecting their rights, um, also uh, policies, uh, gender mainstreaming policies, to uh, the representation of women in the European Parliament. But we also know in times of economic insecurity, austerity, and uncertainty that these rights of women tend to be treated as secondary to economic considerations. Um, so uh, there have been reports from the EU that have found that gender mainstreaming, the gender mainstreaming principle has been abandoned, for example, in most cases when they've looked at policy responses to the economic crisis. So I, I'm not sure whether or not we should expect the same to happen here or not, but I think we should be talking about it. Um, and then I think this also reflects, there are two, I have two sub-points to that point. Um, I think that then in terms of our profession, and I think others will talk about um, access to EU funding and what um, Brexit means for that. But, but we know, or whatever happens, um, access to EU funding, and if the, um, the UK does come through on its promise to replace any uh, funding that is lost due to Brexit, um, is it true that with we women there will still be the same balance and access to that um, research funding? Sure, the ESRC is, is good in terms of its record about gender balance and funding, but it may be that um, the rules, once it's, it's distributed by, um, if the government does replace, if the UK government does replace, we're not sure if it will be distributed by the same rules, if the same principles will be applied. And we know that um, uh, the UK, social sciences in the UK, benefit um, disproportionately from EU funding. But we also know that the UK is interested in funding um, innovation uh, and, and having the social sciences support its industrial strategy. So are those sorts of refocusing of funding, will they make a difference to the access that um, women have uh, to this funding? Um, I also think that um, this neglect of uh, uh, a focus on women's issues and considering it um, 
has been reflected in the narratives that we tell about uh, Brexit, the Brexit vote, the meaning of it, as well as the Trump uh, vote in America, or the outcome in, in the US, which followed closely on Brexit, and has sort of been lumped together in terms of uh, trying to explain it uh, as a rise in populism. Um, and there's been very much a focus on the working uh, class males and the white working class as an explanation um, for uh, Trump's victory as well as the Brexit vote, the sort, of, the sort of group that was left behind or has been left behind by globalization. Um, but what, what then, um, by focusing on that, we, we overlook what um, the role of gender bias and the role that racism and sexism has actually played um, in these uh, recent electoral outcomes. Um, we know that uh, sexism played a, a vote, and it's been demonstrated with now looking at the data, in predicting Trump vote. We know that the debate around surrounding the EU referendum was largely dominated by, by men. Um, so I think, uh, again, I think that those narratives that we're telling also uh, about these two electoral outcomes um, don't focus uh, or tend to ignore those sorts of explanations. Um, and I have a second concern about, um, and this is my final one, about the profession and what, and how we approach these particular projects. And this was directed at Will, who's not here. <laughs> um, and it not really um, directed at him, but I, um, I read his blog post back in, in November 2016, um, which was, uh, he wrote with Martin Jennings. It was called um, The Failure of Political Science. Um, and it was, it, it, was re it was a reflection on uh, the discipline and the place of the discipline in understanding uh, the Trump victory as well as the Brexit vote. And if I can um, just read what he wrote. He says, our analysis did not stand up to the job. Political science analysis did not stand up to the job. And this poses <coughs> fundamental questions about the direction that the discipline has taken in recent decades and its abandonment of a more critical examination of the nature of politics. Critical, I've um, italicized that. Um, political science has lately gl glorified big data, replication, and high-tech computational methods. Um, and I, I was going to take exception with that <laughs> conclusion, and I do take exception uh, with that. I don't think... Um, the lack of our ability to 100% predict um, the vote outcomes is any indication that uh, we need to change our, our methodological um, focus um, and, and what we do. And that we, uh, I, 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 when I heard that, I took it as a call to return to a more critical approach to what we do. Um, and I think that there should be space for that within the discipline, but we should not abandon um, these other uh, methods. I think if we do, we really risk um, uh, losing our ability as a discipline to not only engage with current debates, but also to identify <coughs> the challenges that we're facing uh, as a country or as a, as a society. Um, and what we do is if, if we do take, take a, a more critical turn and abandon those methods, we're, we allow uh, not, it was the economists before that we allowed to set the agenda and to engage in policy discussions. And now we would allow the computer scientists to, to set the agenda, um, so, uh, to set the social science agenda. So I would just caution against um, that. And I don't think um, our, our lack of ability to predict those outcomes precisely, I think we did OK, um, uh, should, should indicate that. All right. So, um, and finally, but at, on a positive note in um, that blog post, Will talked about the, the need to require um, universities or to encourage universities to become part of the wider conversation <coughs> about the importance of certain constitutional and democratic norms. And I think that's hugely important for us to remember as educators that um, is to have conversations about values when we teach, about democratic values, and about value change and the meaning of those and about democratic culture and to discuss the methods by which we study them as well. So I think um, as educators, we should um, certainly focus on that.
Thank you. Uh, I think next is Kis van der Rijk. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I will <coughs> make some comments about three different things. <coughs> I start out with a very trivial one, at least in the first instance, a very trivial one. At a very superficial level, Brexit is a boon for political science. This is a topic on which numerous <coughs> theses, dissertations, uh, papers, articles, books, and whatever will be written. Uh, about its causes, its consequences, uh, the role of specific political actors, uh, the role of structural uh, conditions, the role of the internet, and, and you name it. I mean, it's virtually inexhaustible. Uh, so as far as that's concerned, great. Uh, however, <laughs> however, all of this only contributes to political science with an emphasis a little bit on the second word if it also leads to generalizable insights to new <coughs> paradigms, the development or the update of new theories, conceptual schemata, and so on. Without that, it's all interesting, but episodical and to be forgotten after, well, some interval, which is probably not even too long. But if you think about a number of things that I think Brexit does bring to the fore is maybe that we have not sufficiently, and particularly not for Western societies which we consider to be as well established and consolidated democracies, that we have not sufficiently paid attention to a number of phenomena which in one way or another have been uh, well known in political science, but which I think we ought to look at again. Uh, for, for these kind of societies like Britain is. One is, for instance, the phenomenon of cultural heterogeneity. <coughs> cultural heterogeneity not necessarily in terms of ethnic diversity or linguistic diversity, but in terms of different value systems and the identities that people form on those bases uh, <coughs> and that they subsequently act upon. Uh, cultural heterogeneity in terms of the different perceptions that people have of their own world, and maybe of the world at large, and their own place in it. And I think what we witnessed to some extent in, 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 in the battle for Brexit, if you want to call it that way, uh, is a clash which came between different identities or different cultural systems uh, that was more pronounced and more visible than it had been in, in many other instances earlier, even though it probably manifested itself there as well. But if we pay attention to cultural heterogeneity, also the question comes how we have to manage <coughs> cultural heterogeneity socially and politically. And therefore, I think we have to rethink the basis of what <coughs> Easton refers as political community. I definitely and consciously do not want to use the term nation here, but political community. We have been paying quite a bit of attention to political regimes uh, as one of the, one of the leading uh, concepts uh, that acquired our attention. But I think uh, we have been neglecting attention to notions of political community. Who do we count as part of that and why? And how immutable is that? And how much are we in agreement on that? And what are the consequences uh, of the demarcation between those who are seen as part of a political community and those who are not? So there's one set of themes that I think uh, are called again into our attention uh, by, by Brexit. A second, and to some extent more located in the area, maybe not of culture, but in terms of public policy and policy outcomes, is a theme about the political and cultural consequences of uneven development in countries. It is very obvious that the support for Brexit, but also in other systems like support for Trump, or support for uh, Marine Le Pen, etc., is not evenly spread across the country. Um, and uh, there are therefore new questions which we have to think about with respect 
to uneven development uh, and the consequences of that require, <coughs> uh, acquires a new meaning and uh, requires a new interpretation and I think will then show to be uh, very relevant again. And the third thing that I think comes right away uh, as a topic again uh, for uh, top billing in our attention <coughs> is the theme of not so much the quality of democracy uh, as a way to fulfill uh, the desires of the median voter or something like that, but more to uh, uh, be effective. The, 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 the demo what I would say, the, the democratic capacity of representative and, democ and, and direct democracy as effective channels to manage conflict in society. And particularly, and that picks up to what Susan uh, referred to a moment ago, constitutional arrangements, uh, which are of a nature that would either uh, make and, and enhance that capacity to productively channel conflict uh, or the converse uh, not be able to do so. So, from that perspective, yes, uh, Brexit <coughs> offers a new set of uh, opportunities to talk about all kinds of things and to have all kinds of publications, but I think we have to think about that not as just cheap publications, but as an, as a, as an impetus to rethink a, a number of things and to rekindle, to some extent, a number of uh, theories and concepts uh, that uh, have been for a long time in the discipline but have not always been very prominent recently. The second set of comments is, is, is about something else. Uh, I said there are three somewhat disjointed uh, kinds of comments, so here we go. Should we take Brexit as a separate event or not? Um, Susan already uh, referred to, and I, I did so myself in my previous remarks a, a minute ago, uh, to linking Brexit with other phenomena like Trump's uh, uh, election for <coughs> the presidency, uh, the rise of populism in, in Western societies, uh, etc. And so to some extent we can look at Brexit as a manifestation, amongst other manifestations, of changing cultural climates, of changing patterns of contestation, of changing topics of contestation, uh, and all of that, which are all relevant in the pursuit of political science. Now, although it's tempting to do so, I'm also a little bit reticent to immediately lump all these things together in one category and say, well, they're, they're all manifestations of the same thing. I think it's a stretch for two reasons. First, it supposes <coughs> that we already know what these factors are. And actually, we know woefully little about that. Uh, what are the factors that give rise to uh, the popularity <coughs> of themes, of modes of expression, of issues, which under other circumstances would have been thought to be inconceivable. Um, are they all of the same nature? Are they all driven by the same kind of phenomena? It's often referred to like things like anti-globalism and tribalism, anti-liberalism, and all of that driven by the losers of globalization. Yes and no. Because at the same time we see also all kinds of other things which do not easily coexist with these interpretations. We see, we see an increasing acceptance of, to some extent, cultural diversity and sexual diversity in societies as part of a liberal uh, development that doesn't sit easily with these interpretations of illiberal tendencies. Uh, the notion of individual level losers of globalization as a driver of that has empirically be found to be incredibly problematic and not necessarily getting much support at the individual level. So are all these things one phenomenon? Uh, from a political science perspective, I would, I would argue for some caution in this respect. <coughs> um, uh, at least before we all too hastily uh, pronounce them to be all of the same nature, to uh, look again. Finally, I want to say something, something different again, uh, in these few minutes about the consequences of Brexit for 
what I would call the role of social science and political science in public debate and policy making. And that requires a rethink of the role of values in science and uh, the role of science in debates about values. To some extent, this is a, a set of debates that has been waged numerous times over the past century at least, uh, going back to the beginning of the century, probably the previous, sorry, I, I speak as if we're in the 20th century. <laughs> ah, sorry, uh, <laughs> tell you my age. Uh, uh, has been prominent throughout the 20th century, uh, and even at the end of the 19th century at some moment, but particularly throughout the 20th century, uh, the role of value. And let me, let me, <coughs> sketch my uneasiness uh, and, and the fact that as comes with dilemmas I have not yet, not yet found a resolution of a, a, a number of conflicting tendencies. Let me give you an example of where things are problematic. During the Brexit campaign in Britain there was a group that called itself Economists for Brexit. Fortunately, given the rest of my story, there was not a group political scientists for Brexit. <laughs> Um, but there was a group that called itself Economics for Brexit, and in some way this naming indicates, in my view, a problem. Economic science could tell us all kinds of things, but not whether we should be pro or anti-Brexit. If you call yourself an economist for Brexit, you're not an economist, you're partisan. If you're partisan, you're not a scientist. It's as simple as that. Uh, so economy could help us, perhaps, to say, likely, Unlikely consequences of this or that or yet another form of action would be this, that or the other. And hopefully, to a reasonable degree, proponents for and those against Brexit in the economic profession would agree with each other about those likely consequences. So from that perspective, I'm, I'm proposing to have some distance from too much partisan values. Yet on the other hand, and armed with the knowledge of what has been conducted as harm during the 20th century in particular, uh, on the basis of so-called value-free <coughs> science, we cannot afford a totally value-free science. Knowing that, starting from a position of unequal power, mm -hmm. only the most powerful actors in society would benefit from that with dire consequences for many. And where then, between those two examples, we would have to find the role of values in political science and in our conduct as professional political scientists, I have not yet fully finalized in my own thought. But I think it's a debate that not only during the whole 20th century, but re rekindled, I think, by what we see here, requires our attention. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, oh. So is that okay? Yeah. So um, kind of following up from uh, the previous presentations, I've got two points to make. One is some kind of initial thoughts on how Brexit might affect the UK education sector. And I'll try not to be with too much you know, gloom, doom and gloom here. Um, and then my second point actually speaks to quite a lot of your last point about what is our role in, in, um, in terms of um, kind of having a value-free science. Um, so in terms of the UK education se sector, I want to make three points. First, this whole discussion about um, one of the consequences of Brexit uh, being potentially brain drain for UK universities. Now, of course, it's it's very early to tell anything on this. Um, the only piece of information that I thought was uh, useful enough to discuss or to present with you today was um, a university and college union uh, survey that found that 76% of um, uh, European academics based in the UK are thinking of potentially moving abroad as a result of, of, of the vote. Um, obviously, we don't know whether this will happen. But certainly what we do know is that Brexit has created an environment of uncertainty uh, for a lot of uh, UK-based academics that are EU nationals, an environment of insecurity. And 
Another potential consequence is that less people who are um, EU nationals are applying for jobs <coughs> in the UK. Uh, so, which means that if this is true, and I, I have some anecdotal evidence from people I speak that actually the UK is not an attraction for them anymore to move, say, from Germany or from um, France or the Netherlands and so on to, to the UK. So that's certainly something to take into consideration in terms of the pool of, 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 of candidates uh, that we are choosing to get jobs in our uh, universities and become our colleagues. Um, a second kind of sad point here it has to do with access to EU funds, and I'm not going to talk a lot on that because I think Rick will probably touch upon that as well. Uh, but um, you know, Horizon 2020, apparently one of its objectives is to remove barriers to innovation. And it seems that Brexit has actually, in, in some kind of um, side effect of Brexit, would be to actually re-establish those barriers to, to innovation. Uh, Philip Hammond has told us that actually the Treasury will underwrite the payments of, of every award until uh, 2020 and, uh, or, or, or the, as part of the Horizon 2020. But, um, so the referendum does not have an immediate effect. But we don't know, obviously, what the long term would be. And academics, obviously, are passionate for the profession, but also are rational individuals. And I could think that quite a lot of them might be thinking of potentially moving to uh, another institution uh, outside the UK if they had, say, an ERC grant, uh, or becoming visiting scholars, or having two kind of posts or part-time posts into universities and so on, which again kind of might speak into the brain, brain drain point that I mentioned before, but crucially it will also mean that universities will have less income coming from the European Union and already we are having quite a lot of strain on our resources as academics, which potentially could mean uh, more teaching for us because we might have to um, gain these resources in, in, a, in a different way, which would mean a, a serious restructuring of our workload, for example. Uh, obviously, potential centers that could be established through access to EU funds may not be established. Again, there is a lot of uncertainty on whether the government will supplement those uh, uh, grants in the future. Uh, my third point here would be access to Erasmus, and again, I don't want to talk a lot about that, but what I understand is that universities are becoming reluctant to have, to, to, to have long-term Erasmus contracts. And I say that because I used to be the Erasmus coordinator in my department, and we usually started with, with uh, uh, contracts that lasted between three years and five years. Uh, so we went through the negotiation, and then we set up medium to long term contracts and now the tendency is to actually set up uh, contracts that only last for one year because we really no, don't know what, 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 uh, uh, what will happen in the future. And uh, again it's kind of ironic because these schemes are, are designed to uh, promote international mobility, uh, mobility for students, mobility for staff, but actually universities who want to promote these things are actually quite cautious uh, at the moment. Um, so, the, the second point I wanted to make is, is kind of some preliminary thoughts on the potential impact of Brexit on our role as academics. And um, um, Susan also talked about our role as academics as an educator. And I think that's quite useful. Um, what we see in the UK, from my experience and others, is that increasingly, uh, in addition to our role as academics, um, another role that we have is a role of impact generators. And um, I'm sure uh, some of you might have uh, applied for grants such as the ESRC. So as part of the ESRC, we need to submit um, documents that are pathways to impact kind of documents uh, where we have to actually show that we engage with potential user groups uh, even before we start the research. So we've got, uh, um, we've got, we've got the, the the uh, funding bodies, such as the ESRC and others, kind of pushing us towards that direction. We also have universities who, obviously, for um, REF purposes, they want to construct impact cases. So there is that push or pressure coming from that um, from that side. And, and my question here is: How can we reconcile this pressure 
And maybe pressure is a negative uh, word, maybe it actually, you know, it's, it's a good thing. I, I, I don't want to take a stance on that. But how do we, can we actually deliver on this in an era of post-truth politics? And then again, this speaks to Brexit as one example of a wider phenomenon of Trumpism and so on, uh, of, 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 of post-truth uh, um, politics, where actually emotion becomes much more important in a debate as opposed to facts. And also, because of this whole post-truth discussion, experts like us are, are, are treated with a bit differently uh, in public engagement events, in the media, and so on, as they, as they uh, compare to the past. So I see, basically, a tension between, on the one hand, um, our role as impact generators and entering out of an era of post-truth politics, uh, on the other hand. And here I've, um, I've identified basically three problems that I want to briefly um, share with you. Um, one is that we get involved in a lot of public engagement events, but it seems that quite a lot of people, or there is a trend actually, that uh, people do not feel that, um, people do not understand that academics do not express opinions. And that's quite important. People do not understand that we put forward claims that result from empirically verified research. And that's one thing, and it's, it's something for us to reflect upon and see how we can change how people uh, think. So for example, if, if, a, public, uh, if, if a party politics scholar um, suggests that UKIP, for instance, is a Eurosceptic and anti-establishment party, this is not because this scholar belongs to a pro-EU liberal elite, it's actually because this scholar has uh, worked on this specific case and he or she is able to situate the party and its characteristics within the wider universe of political parties and see, show how this party is, um, what's, what it shares or doesn't share with, with other parties. And actually this is made even more difficult by journalists who, who <coughs> quite often push academics towards making predictions. And when I was... Um, educated, when I did my PhD at the LSE, I was taught that actually academics were not really meant to be making predictions per se, but they were meant to A, try to use what we know from the past in order to understand the future, you know, to understand what's happening, and secondly, actually do not predict but estimate, generate estimations based on a level of confidence as opposed to predicting the future. So that's one issue that I think we as academics we need to reflect on how to go about it and how to address it in this era of post-truth uh, politics. So people like experts, obviously I'm going to uh, again um, quote Michael Gove here, the notorious claim that you know we've had enough of experts and, and some people will just not listen, they will selectively expose themselves into different kinds of information and even if they do listen or happen to listen to in public engagement events to what we say, they will simply don't not want to actually uh, take in what we say just because they feel that we belong into a specific uh, elite and we do specific interests and so on. Which actually takes me to my last point, with, uh, which relates to ethical considerations regarding to the impartiality of our research. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to ensure the maximum impact of our researchers, even from the, uh, the stages of drafting a, a, an application proposal. So uh, we need to ensure that user groups are engaged from the beginning of the process. And that's a good thing, right? But um, for people who work in electoral politics, party politics, and so on, these user groups are usually approached through the means of think tanks. And think tanks are not impartial. We all know that. Think tanks are actually, they, they tend to, to argue that they are impartial, but in reality they are not. So um, that is problematic um, because, especially because now think tanks are um, used to be approached, to being approached by academics even more, they actually become quite um, picky and quite pushy in what they want. And in, in the sense that quite a lot of them want to explicitly be part of the design of the research. And that of course is problematic because you, 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 you want to ensure the impartiality of, of your research to the maximum extent uh, uh, possible. So this might compromise the integrity of the research 
or, or, or we need to actually reflect upon how we wouldn't compromise it. And I've even, even heard from a think tank that actually we need to <coughs> check the results before we commit to, to, to working with academic X. Kind of to close my talk, I, I think we all need to reflect upon what is our role as uh, impact generators in an era of post-truth uh, politics and how we're going to address this tension that is inherent uh, in, in these times. <coughs> okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak. Apologies to those of you who are expecting uh, Will Jennings at this point. Um, I'm not sure exactly what he would have said, but um, I, I'm going to talk a bit um, and try and pick up on some points already made about opportunities and constraints that there are for political science as a result of Brexit. Um, I, I agree with Case that I think this does open up lots of areas for research. So there's perhaps quite a lot of acad academics now are going to do research that they maybe hoped they wouldn't have done um, on Brexit, on various aspects of Brexit and how it works. Um, and amongst many of these, some have already been mentioned by other panellists, but I think the effect on political parties is quite an interesting one in terms of, of the divisions within political parties and the, the, the kind of unity between certain political parties on this issue. In the UK case, of course, it's interesting from the perspective of the Labour Party, which now seems heavily divided on this issue, and so now we, we have an election coming up which will allow us to, to test some hypotheses about how much this is becoming a new cleavage in British politics, which I think is another area that, that we, we can potentially look at. Um, the picture on that, of course, is unclear, and it will take a few elections for us to know whether this is something that is, an, is a kind of a new uh, division that's going to structure voting in some way. Um, I thought I'd quote a little bit of the British election study data on this, um, where it seems that Remainers and Leavers have moved around quite a lot since the 2015 election. Um, and so there's now quite a large chunk of people who say they're undecided. Um, and this, for both Remainers and Leavers, is like the third largest category um, of voter. Um, and this, of course, means that perhaps you know, we, will, we will get less of that as we get closer to the election. Um, but about 56% about of each group, Leavers and Remainers, have said they would vote for the same party at the end of 2016 as they would in 2015. But that leaves substantial chunks of people who might uh, shift their vote at this election. Um, it also appears that UKIP have lost out to the Conservatives in quite a, quite a big way. Um, there have been considerable drops in their support, and, and it looks like we've seen those made, made enough polls that there, there's a statistically significant drop um, going on there. Um, Labour voters seem to be shifting to other parties, for both Remainers and Leavers, um, quite a lot shifting to Undecided, some Leavers shifting to UKIP, um, and some to the Liberal Democrats as well. But also the data at the moment seems to suggest that the Liberal Democrat vote hasn't been boosted quite as much as, as the Liberal Democrats would hope. Um, and so they've gained a certain amount, but maybe not enough to make a, a dramatic sort of difference. So at the moment, the Conservatives look to be the party of Leave voters, so there is a d divide in that sense, but the Remain vote is split quite heavily across um, undecideds and different parties. Um, but certainly the EU issue is, is now ranking very highly in the Mori Issues Index, which is this monthly uh, index of what people think is the most important issue facing the UK at any one time. Um, and so it's clearly going to be um, a major issue alongside others in this election, but I think it's probably too early to say whether we've seen some kind of uh, realignment or not. Um, another interesting area that, uh, that we can study is about parliaments and how parliaments deal with the European Union. Um, and of course the UK uh, is, is, is a kind of interesting case here and I think um, building on some of what's been said before, uh, it's interesting to think about what the comparators might be for dealing with something like Brexit. So there is now quite a big literature on how parliaments deal with the European Union. Um, but how they deal with leaving the EU and how they'll deal with some kind of bespoke membership of the EU afterwards is quite an interesting set of questions. Um, there have been, so Brexit has been dominating Parliament recently, so there have been 50 or more select committee reports related to Brexit um, since the referendum and, and if we include the period before that, since the last election. Um, and so many of those reports are going to make them to an end kind of, um, too early before this, this current election. But we'll see more of those afterwards. We'll see uh, the Great Repeal Bill as well, and a series of other bills after that, which will try to put EU law into, into UK law. So Parliament's agenda is going to be dominated by this um, for a long period of time. Um, one interesting question in terms of party unity, then, is what the Parliamentary Conservative Party will look like after the next election. So I guess most people are assuming it's going to be bigger than it is at the moment. 
Um, but the, what will that new intake of Conservative MPs look like? We know that um, some, quite a lot of the 2010 new Conservative MPs were um, uh, quite rebellious quite early on, and so that, that might cause an issue for Theresa May. But on the other hand, if she has a bigger majority, then that rebellion <coughs> will be less consequential. I think it also raises attention, uh, certainly in the UK case, where there's a tradition of representative democracy, a tension between direct democracy and representative democracy. And this came out, I think, in what Theresa May said uh, when, she, when she called this election, or I say called it, she has to work, of course, within the Fixed Term Parliament Act, but when she uh, um, said that there was going to be a vote on this. Um, she said that Parliament is not united on this front and that the country is kind of coming together on the Brexit issue. I'm not sure whether this is, this is true. Um, and I think on the one hand, of course, we have to have losers' consent. This is a really important part of democracy. So uh, people who, who don't want the UK to leave the EU have to consent to the, the outcome of this referendum. So the margin of victory wasn't that big, but the result was never less clear, and it wasn't like we were having handy chads to deal with or uh, counting up votes in any particular places. Um, but should we expect there not to be any representation for the Remainers in Parliament? I don't think we should expect that. I think um, we shouldn't expect Parliament to be entirely united on this front. Um, and of course it won't be after the uh, election, but the chances are there'll be more Conservatives there. So um, it raises an interesting question which we perhaps face more and more in this country between direct democracy, this tension between that and representative um, democracy. Also, we can ask questions about um, what uh, the classic sort of theories of European integration have to say about this kind of disintegration as well, I think. Um, and this is partly, of course, important because the nature of the UK's deal might affect the way that other countries think about their EU membership. Um, and so um, Remainers were arguing beforehand that you know, the EU has an incentive not to give the UK a good deal because it doesn't want other countries to leave. Um, we'll have to see how that, that plays out in the negotiations. Um, but another opportunity is that, of course, that money is being put into studying Brexit, um, as other people have already alluded to. And so the ESRC has announced a, a series of grants that are, are about looking at the Brexit process in particular. Um, so I'll just say a few things then in the, the few minutes I've got left on constraints. Um, and some of these have been touched on already. Um, one of which, of course, is about research funding, and I, I won't repeat what's already been said, um, except to say that there are precedents, of course, for countries, and Switzerland is a prominent one of these, being outside of the EU, but also being able to access uh, uh, Horizon 2020 funding and other sorts of funding. Um, so there are 16 countries at the moment that are not in the EU, but do participate in Horizon 2020. Um, and those, of course, include Switzerland, which was partially out of this for a period of time, but since the start of 2017 has been uh, fully in there. Um, and crucially, of course, the Swiss case relates to the freedom of movement, and this was one of the reasons why Switzerland was not fully in this uh, uh, research uh, funding. Um, but there are countries like Israel, for example, that have had a lot of success at getting um, EU research funding um, without being within the EU. Um, the problem for the UK, of course, is that it's a big beneficiary from this funding stream, but at the same time, um, if, it's not, uh, if it's not fully involved with it, then it won't have a say in the direction of the EU framework programmes, which of course is uh, problematic. But it does seem, it seems perhaps a reasonable assumption that, that given what the government's promised in its white paper um, on, on its negotiating objectives, that it will try to allow the UK to remain in Horizon 2020 funding. Um, and hopefully in Erasmus, uh, if not in Erasmus, then um, in some kind of equivalent scheme that would have to be set up quite quickly um, to start running from once the UK left um, the EU. Um, I'd echo the concerns of others about academic staff. So, Something like 16% of academic staff in the UK are from EU countries. Um, there's also a, 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 um, about half that sort of number, about 12,000 people who are non-academic staff from EU countries as well. And so the select committees in the House of Commons, both the Education Committee and the Brexit Committee, have been calling for the government to take steps by the end of this year to guarantee the rights of, of, um, of those people um, if there's any kind of delay in agreeing that with, with the EU. Um, and of course, um, the other thing is about students and Erasmus, and so we, at the moment, this, this is important as for sort of income streams for universities and student numbers. Um, so the government hasn't guaranteed anything beyond 2017-18 in terms of uh, allowing EU students to study for the same fees as do um, home students. But again, Parliament select committees have been calling for that to be extended for uh, a longer period of time. 
So um, I'll finish just by saying that, that um, I hope that the negotiations between the UK and the EU will take a kind of uh, reasonable approach on both sides, um, which could lead to um, some bespoke agreements on education and on research funding. Um, but whether that will happen or not, I'm not going to try and predict. Thank you very much for this uh, very inspiring and broad coverage of the topic. Let me just say very briefly that one great topic here is technicality, so probably to make it long story short is whether Britain will go the Norwegian or Swiss way, what will be the cooperation looking at.